So the next part of his analysis of the brain talks about the way in which um, the, the brain links to language. And the first thing he indicates is that there's no specific place in the brain for symbol processing. Rather, symbol associations re result from the overall structure of the brain. Um, and he, you know, what, what, you know, what he talks about is the way in which developing these symbolic relationships uh, requires taking you know, sensory information and subordinating it again to these symbol-symbol relationships. Um, and in a way that you can construct a new symbol that can then be related back to these sensory information. And, and what I think is important here is the way in which the symbolic reference not only re requires this relationship of symbol to symbol, um, but a key function of these symbols is to create new symbols by reinterpreting the relationships between symbols in a new way and then providing a kind of a novel response to stimuli you get, you know, uh, stimuli from the environment, right? So, you know, one of the things about, you know, one of the characteristics of being able to create new ideas is really kind of rearranging things that you've experienced in a new way that, you know, come to, gives you some new results, right? And, and the ability to manipulate these sign-sign relationships within the brain is really the prerequisite for that ability to come up with new sets of relationships, right? Um, and, and this, you know, this, this is done not in a particular part of the brain, but really through um, the ability to, through a kind of overall structure of the brain in which different pieces of the brain, different, you know, uh, aspects of the brain are then kind of rethought through, re reconfigured into a new set of relationships. So it's, it's really about the overall structure of the brain. It's not about a particular language module for Deacon, right? Um, so, you know, what he's indicating then overall is that the human brain could have developed this language capacity as a result of relatively few genetic variations. Because, the, the, you know, first of all, the size of the different parts of the brain in relationship to, to each other they have a large effect on brain function, but they're actually controlled by a relatively few number of genes that regulate the segmentation pattern of different parts of the brain in development. So it's really, I mean, I'm not going to go into the details of this, but he, you know, he goes through this very elaborate discussion of, you know, uh, brain anatomy and how really there are very few, uh, there are very few number of genes that are able to control the, the size, the relative size of different parts of the brain. And then the other, <coughs> the other point that he makes is that the bulk of the information that's stored in the brain is not determined genetically, but rather develops through this inner brain process of natural selection that we've gone through, and that you know, doesn't require much genetic information to be pre-programmed, but allows for the, the, the internal structure of the brain to develop um, on the fly as the brain develops in the organism, right? And finally, what he also indicates is that language itself doesn't depend so much on a specific grammar, but on a general capacity for symbolic processing that results also from the overall structure of the human brain, right? So those are the, you know, the basic arguments that he has for indicating that it could have happened through natural selection through um, really a, f a relatively few number of um, changes in our genetic makeup, right? And so, uh, just to kind of kind of summarize the difference between Deacon and Pinker, I want to just take these examples that they both give. They both look at Broca's aphasia and Banneker's aphasia as uh, evidence for their claims, but they they have different claims, right? And so, you know, Pinker claims that language is processed in a specific module of the brain based on you know the the types of aphasia, the language deficits you get with these these uh, these brain damage to the different parts of the brain. Deacon concludes. Differently, he says that language is processed through the interaction with each other of many different areas of the brain and that the damage to those areas is not an indication that these, th these are the language modules, but rather that those are areas that are sort of connecting points of the brain uh, that, are, that are important for sort of connecting um, internal brain processes with sort of you know, the kind of the, 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 the speech processes. And so they're, they're not I important as language modules, but they're, they're important as a kind of, kind of uh, connecting points of the brain, right? Um, whereas, you know, with Pinker, he sees them as sort of the, the places where the, the language processing takes place, right? And so, you know, the different warrants are, you know, Pinker, Pinker's warrant is that <coughs> the language processing requires a set of rules of grammar that are embedded in the brain. 
Deacon indicates his warrant is that the language processing pr pr proceeds by constantly shifting the patterns by which different signs relate to each other in order to, to establish symbolic relationships. Grammar develops spontaneously as a way to accomplish this task. It's not the cause of that. It's, it's, it's a kind of effect of this requirement of symbolic processing in language. Right? Um, similarly, we get the same kind of difference in warrants in Pinker and Deacon when in, in talking about the, the Williams, that chatterbox syndrome, right? And you know, where, where Pinker sees um, that as a, an example of kind of a language module functioning, whereas the rest of intelligence doesn't, Deacon explains it by saying that the Williams syndrome leads to a reduction of the size of the, size of the area of the brain that links the prefrontal cortex to sensory centers, so it disturbs that uh, linking of symbolic to indexical relationships, right? Because you have to have both. It's not that you can do without the indexical relationships. And so the, the, the result for Williams syndrome patients is an, um, it's an ability to manipulate these sign-sign relationships, but they don't have a clear understanding of that pragmatic relationship of those signs to the, to the objects that they're referring to. And, and that's, the, that's the primary difficulty. So again, he's sort of locating the problem in the way that different parts of the brain relate to each other, right? Um, so, let me see. Well, we're, we're out of time, really. So, I'm going to finish this up next time, and we're going to finish uh, with chapters 11 and 12.